drag and drop. I would say for fly fishermen, all carp fly fishermen, it's upwards of 75% of the carp that we connect with is from this technique called drag and drop. This is by far and away the most important technique to learn about how to actually get your fly in front of the carp. There's some other ones, and like when we talked about leading them by five feet, that's a different technique. It's not as effective, but there are situations where we use that one. Um, drag and drop, essentially what we're doing, and this is why when I talked about how long my leader is, this is where this becomes important. I wanna cast basically half the distance of my leader past the carp so that my fly lands four, five, six, eight, nine feet away from the carp when it hits the water. Because that lateral line is so sensitive, the closer that fly lands to the carp, the more chance I'm gonna spook it, just with that fly landing in that area. And that's usually where we spook fish. That fly lands, it's too close and it scares them. Especially if we're casting a heavier fly, a dumbbell eye, which is what most people use um, over like a bead chain or a faux pearl. You cast a dumbbell within five or six feet on the surface of a carp, typically you're gonna spook the carp. So the longer that leader is, the better. Now the next thing that scares them is my fly line when it lands. So if I have an 18 foot leader, all of a sudden I've got a much bigger range that I can put that fly and fly line and not scare the fish, right? Cause I gotta land it on each side of the fish for drag and drop. So you cast past it, you quickly, so, so ideally I cast it out as soon as the fly lands, I'm lifting my fly rod before my fly line even gets to the water. Fly hits, rod comes up, I keep my fly line off the water and I pull that fly until it's in the area above the carp where I can drop it down to land within that 12 inches, not directly in front, a little bit behind the eyes to the front of the eyes area around the carp's head. That's what I'm trying to do. So it's, a, it's, it's tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it's not that bad. Um, and if you, if you use longer leader and your fly line does hit the water, it's not as big of a deal. Right? You don't want the full thing coming down and drag, but like, you know, if you get it on it a little bit, it's not going to scare the carp, likely. Um, once the fly drops, so I mean, I, so I pull it over uh, into the area where when I release it, it's going to drop down into the target area. So like, I mean, I, I let all everything off. I don't want any tension on that line at all. I want it to come down and flutter down into that feeding area. And then I'm looking for, you know, sometimes it's really clear. You know, you'll see the, the fish eat your fly because you'll see the fly, you know, and the fish come off and eat it. That's the best. But sometimes you can't see the fly. You know you got it in about the right spot. And then you're looking for that mouth to open. You're looking for a quick change of direction from the carp. Um, or, yeah, they'll sometimes they'll lift their head because they'll, they'll see it coming down and they'll actually come up for it a little bit and eat it, depending on how the fly's falling. You're looking for some kind of unusual movement that will tell you that that carp has taken the fly. Again, I don't have any tension on it. So at that point, I need to set the hook. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a trout set most of the time or a hybrid set to try to get tension back on that and, and set the hook. Um, super, this is, this, you get this down, you'll start catching carp. And, and you can get in position without scaring them. Um, and, and, and I spent 20 years not knowing this technique and catching the occasional carp and it would be a struggle and I'd have fun, but I never really like, like I, I prefer like if you gave me the choice today to go fish for carp or trout, I'm fishing carp. It's not even close to me. I would way rather go fish for carp, but it took learning this technique and being able to connect with them on a regular basis for that because it can get pretty frustrating. You go, I know people that go out 10 times and don't catch carp. This technique changes it to where I can go catch 40 in a day, 50 in a day sometimes, using this technique. Um, all right, so let's, I'm gonna show some videos here. So you guys, all right, so we already kind of watched this video, but now you'll see from a drag and drop standpoint, okay? Cast past the fish. Now this is obviously very close. Pull the fly over, drop it down here. Now I get my line tight here because I can't really see the fish. I don't know what's going on there. So you see how I got my line tight as quick as I could? <laughs> Because I thought he was in the area and I'm like, man, he may have eaten it, but I don't want to yank it out because I wasn't sure. So I did a strip set there. So here it's kind of slow motion, um, zoomed in, a little harder to see, but right, I don't have good visibility. So right there, he dove to the bottom after it. I couldn't see him anymore. And that's when I was doing the strip set 
until I felt him connect. Okay, again, drag and drop, right? There's the fish right there. I cast past him down here, pull it up, drop it down. Now you see how I actually jigged it again? I didn't like where I saw it coming down. It was going to be on the far side of him, so I picked it up a little bit, pulled it to the other side, and then he turned towards me and came and got it, and then you saw the trout set coming straight at me. Again, you can kind of see it there. The gap between the fish and where the fly came in. Hard to see in here, but like I said, it was coming too far to the other side. And something I should mention really quick here is that um, if, if the carp feels the line before it gets to the fly, it's going to spook it, right? If you line the fish, you're going to spook it. Um, so, so really, like if they're coming this way, I want the fly to be just to this side of the carp, right? Whatever direction they're going, I want to make sure that my connection for my rod tip to that fly, the carp's not going to intercept my line. Lining the fish is going to, is going to scare the carp too. So that's what I did there. I was, where I was going to end up there on my first drop was going to end up lining it. So I picked it up again a little bit just to move it to the other side. I would tell people that wanted to try this and like just use some carp flies, Use some faux pearl or bead chains to begin with until you get the hang of it. Because it's going to give you a lot more margin for error. Um, having said that, the way these carp are moving, you need to time it, right? So like if I, if I would, for that one right there, I was using dumbbell eyes. If I was using uh, bead chain, even bead chain or faux pearl, it wouldn't have made it down fast enough. Um, right? It would still have been fluttering when the carp went by. He had never, it had never been in that, that range where he's gonna see it and eat it. So that's where the, the weight of the fly becomes important because you gotta get it, you gotta get it in that close range. I, I really like light flies because they flutter down slowly. Um, you're, you're, you tend to be, they're, they're more forgiving, right? Because if I splash that down closer to them, it makes a heck of a lot less of a disturbance. But then you have to time that with how the, how the fish are, it becomes more complicated to get it in front of a deeper fish. I've caught some, some fish fairly deep with light flies, but I mean, if it's more than like three feet of water, I'm almost always using dumbbell eyes. Usually if you're not within 12 inches, it's not going to, you're not going to get them. They're not going to go after it. They are lazy. <laughs> they, if the food isn't there, they're, they're, if it's not right there, they're not going to go chase it down. Now, having said that, once you hook them, they become less lazy. <laughs> but until that point, they are very lazy. They're not, they won't chase stuff down. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, but yeah, and, and that's why we use various weights um, to try to make sure we get it into that area. But yeah, light, definitely starting out, use light. Okay, so again, another drag and drop here. This was a light fly. I didn't cast too far past him, hold it over. What's funny is, Right as he sucked that in, so he inhales it, he feels the line. Like, watch how fast he freaks out once he sucks here. A drag and drop. You can't see the fly on this one, uh, using a little bit smaller fly there. Um, and so I actually lifted it there because I thought, is that it? Is that it? I, like, I wasn't sure. I didn't want to pull it out if he hadn't got to it. And then I felt him. And it was like... <laughs> yeah. I wish I was fishing right now. I gotta be honest with you guys. <laughs> yeah, and then like people don't think they're like athletic. I mean, I see them, they'll come out of the water on you sometimes and then tail dance and yeah, they're they're just absolutely awesome. So this one's kind of cool because I was I actually was too close on this one. I cast it. This is not a good cast, but because I was using a very light fly, I got away with it here. If I was using a heavier fly, there's no way I would have scared the crap out of him. So you'll see it come in on the second picture. Yeah, and I love that. Um, yeah, see that right there? That's way too close. But I was using a very light fly, so I got away with it. Um, even then, sometimes you won't. But if you're going to cast that close, you want to make sure it's a very, very light fly. Yep. Sometimes they will. Sometimes they will. Yeah, absolutely. So, so if you watch, actually watch this one right here, you can't see the fly, but 
he'll come over, he's coming over right here. He never eats off the bottom right there. See that? So he picked that one up suspended. Okay, he's drag and drop coming down. This one actually does the same thing where he's picked. Th this water is moving slightly too. There, this is a creek. Um, but yeah, same thing here. He swam over and he ate it. And, and, and moving water is harder to tell where your fly actually ends up, right? You cast it out there and you let it, it's nymphing a little bit. <laughs> but he actually, he, he moves over and, and eats it before it gets to the bottom right there. And these are, these are some cool, so he's not quite 90. And, and you see, I actually landed my fly line a little bit too close to him there. Um, I got away with it. He was so intent on the mud that he didn't notice it. Sometimes you get lucky. <laughs> but then you see the fly come in, right? That, that was too close or too far. But there's the fly. And then you see that where he, he charges, right? They're not charging far, but that's that motion that you're looking for for, for when they eat when you're doing this. Again, yeah, see the fly come in right there, and then you watch him turn, and he eats that one before it gets to the bottom. Uh, no, that was half speed. Yeah, that's real time. No, that's half speed too. I lied. <laughs> okay, and then there's this one's coming straight at me. See the flag come in. Again, he comes up there, higher in the water, and he eats that there. <laughs>